Good morning, everybody, and can I welcome you all to the 23rd meeting of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. Can we please make sure all electronic devices are on silent mode? This morning, we've received apologies from Oliver Mundell. Our first item of business today is an oral evidence session on the Age of Criminal Responsibility Scotland Bill. We have two panels of witnesses giving us evidence this morning. I'd like to welcome our first panel. Detective Chief Superintendent Leslie Bow, Head of Public Protection at Police Scotland. Sergeant James Devoy of the Children and Young People Business Area at Police Scotland. Juliet Harris, Director of Together, the Scottish Alliance for Children's Rights. And Kate Rocks, Chief Social Work Officer at East Renfrewshire Council and a member of Social Work Scotland. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're not going to have opening statements this morning. We're going to move um, straight to questions. There's a lot to get through. So first, if I can bring in Fulton McGregor, please. Yeah, good, good morning, panel. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we took our first evidence session uh, in relation to this bill. And what was quite clear from the two, the two uh, panels that were there was that, that there was a need for this bill to be brought into place and for the age of criminal responsibility to be increased. Do you, just a general question to open up, do you agree that the age of criminal responsibility should be increased? From that one? Yeah, um, yeah I think as Police Scotland said in our written uh, evidence, Police Scotland welcomes legislation to raise the age of criminal responsibility to 12 years. Um, nothing would please, uh, please Police Scotland more, our officers and staff, that if we never had to use the powers in the, uh, that are being provided in the bill, um, because that would mean that no, um, no child was implicated in causing the type of serious harm the bill responds to. However, we're well aware, unfortunately, due to experience and reality, that um, that's not the case, and such occasions do rise. So I suppose what we want to see from the bill is to be able to respond to children who maybe be displaying serious harm for behaviour, um, the victims of serious crime, and the wider communities we serve. Panel members like to come in on that. Kate. Social Work Scotland point of view, we also support the position of, um, of the increasing the age of criminal responsibility to 12. We think that it is a positive move in terms of Scottish Government and it will help us to focus much more on the needs and the well-being of children, particularly under the age of 12, that have been brought into the criminal justice system before. Um, notwithstanding that, we also have got some concerns about some of the construction of the bill in terms of the processes that may well sit with children under the age of 12. And I would imagine the panel would perhaps want to ask us more questions about that. Sure. Julia. Um, definitely, we really welcome the fact that we're talking about raising the age of criminal responsibility. It's something that we've been pushing for for well over 10 years, and it has been described as Scotland's shame that it's only eight years old. Um, from our perspective, then, it should be higher than 12. Um, this is just bringing us up to an absolute minimum. Um, you could actually say it's even below international standards. Um, if you look across Europe, out of 28 states, then 23 of them have a minimum age of criminal responsibility of over four, or 14 or over. And the countries that we like to look at in terms of their approach to um, children and young people, if we look at Norway, Sweden, Iceland, all of their ages of criminal responsibility are 15. Um, it's something that the Parliamentary Assembly for the Council of Europe called for a minimum of 14, and that was back in 2010. So whilst I welcome the fact that we're talking about raising the age of criminal responsibility in Scotland, it really should be higher than 12. And this isn't just from a kind of children's rights perspective of this is what international human rights law says. I'm saying this because we know it's the right thing to do. International human rights law is of that way because we know a higher age of um, criminal responsibility, it reduces re-offending, um, it increases public safety. It's aligned with the trauma-based approach that everybody is now more aware of and um, aligned with a rights-based approach. So yeah, in summary, it's 12 is a start, but it's not good enough and it should be higher than that. James, do you wish to add anything to that? It's part of a journey I think we've been on for a number of years, particularly over the last 10 years, there's been a sea change in the way we respond to the needs of children. 
and we very much, even from a policing perspective, we look at it very much from a needs-based perspective. We have got a four-year plan published now that looks at the rights and the needs of children, specifically focusing on those rights and needs. So this is part of that process, but it is about getting a balance. It's about the balance between the rights of a society and a community to be safe and the needs of those very young children that we're talking about under 12 and how you respond effectively to each individual child. And it has to be centred on those each individual children and not a process that we put the child through. Thank you. Dalton. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> before I continue on, uh, one of the, the questions I was going to ask, because it came out very strongly in the previous panels, was if, uh, if, you, if, if you feel that 12 is far enough. Only, Julia, only you touched on that in your answer, and I'm wondering, before I move on briefly, if, if the other panellists um, could comment on that, if they feel that 12 is the right age, or if the, the service that you represent believes that it should be higher. Um, I think the bill is the starting point. Um, however, in terms of Police Scotland's view, I suppose um, our position is that we pl uh, police with the consent and the will of the people expressed through the democratic process and through the parliament. And it will be for the Scottish Government on behalf of and with the support of Scottish communities to set that age of criminal responsibility. Um, whatever age, whether it increases further to 12, I think has to be recognised and acknowledged and accepted that it will require societal buy-in. Um, and I think there was some commentary last week um, about occasions when children do bad things and how we all need to um, accept it. Um, so it's not only in relation to Police Scotland, whether we agree it's 12 or above, actually, I think it's really for every community in Scotland to be able to um, appreciate and agree and accept that if children over 12, whatever age that might be, do really seriously bad things, then that is, is fine for them. Um, and I, I, I particularly don't think that in terms of all communities across Scotland we're there yet. I think that's a journey um, that has to be um, embarked on. I, from Social Work Scotland's point of view, we've had less debate about the age and more about the impact on the bill. And I think that would be the starting point for us to kind of pick up Juliet's point about ensuring that whatever the impact is, that it is around um, ensuring that it is trauma, there is a level of trauma recovery, because children don't commit offences in isolation to their experiences and the trauma that they have throughout their childhood. And that would be our plea. So irrespective of whether you're 10, 12 or 14, the system needs to be curious enough to ask what has happened to the child, as opposed to just looking at criminality being or the causation of it or some kind of um, one-off event because that isn't our experience as social workers. That's not what happens to children. They don't suddenly wake up one day and decide to uh, commit a crime. And, and so it is not a kind of cop-out from Social Work Scotland in terms of that. It's just that we need to have a different focus. We need to have a different philosophy of care and that is about how we, as a society in Scotland, view children and get underneath about why children commit these offences, as opposed to looking at some kind of outcome or a process that actually is only a process that it doesn't help that child to recover. So that's our position. Fulton, I'm sorry, I'm just going to... Alex, you've got a, a quick supplementary well, on that. I'll just bring on that very, thank you, Fulton. Uh, just on that very specific point, Kate, you, um, I think, elucidate very clearly the importance of a trauma-informed approach to this. Last, uh, the last session we took evidence, we heard a very compelling story of Lindsay Hanvidge, who is a person of care experience. She's a champion for Who Cares Scotland, telling us the, the terrible story of the night that she was about to be taken into care at, 30, at the age of 13, didn't want to be taken into 
into care kicked off and spent the night in the cells for the behavior that she exhibited in trying to resist being taken into care. So that's one uh, catalyst of trauma being met by a deeply traumatizing experience of having to spend a night in a police cell. Um, and I think, you know, I, I was really struck by the unanimity of our last panel that said that actually um, the, the 12 is a floor and not a ceiling and that, you know, we've heard from Juliet and the raft of countries that, that don't have that. So, um, do you think that um, even if we don't move it past 12, we should be dealing with kids between 12 and 18 in a different way than we do adult offenders? Absolutely. And, and actually what we know is that we've now got the neuroscience to show that actually in the past, we and I've probably been there, that just kind of considered the behaviour as a social worker many years ago of that, that young person and not actually thought enough about why it's the why and what has happened here. So actually we have to have a much more humane way and um, hu compassionate way as a society about how we, how we deal with 12 to 18 year olds. And actually what we're now understanding is that for many even older, you know, though that's a, a different conversation for a different place. But actually, we know that the teenage brain um, continues to develop up to the age of 25. So the fact is that we're moving it to 12, as again, Social Work Scotland support it. But I think it's only the beginning of a conversation. It's not the end of the conversation. Fulton, sorry, <coughs> I'm, I'm going to abuse my chair a little bit and just yeah, okay. jump in briefly. Um, folks, I suppose that I, I would you know, endorse what you're saying, but I suppose as I sit here, I wonder about, when we talk about serious crime, we're obviously talking about violence or, or, or sexual crime, and if it's teenagers that are perpetrating that, it's probably likely to be children, teenagers that are on the receiving end. How do they come into this when we're, when we're looking at um, the impact? Of course, yeah. We deal with these situations every day within social work. Police and social work deal with it. We have really good child protection procedures and processes that safeguard children at this moment in time. Our starting point in child protection is what has happened here and where does the risk lie to children, not, to that, not only to that individual child, because we still have to manage, the behaviours that have resulted in it being bringing, brought to the attention of police and social work, but the risk to other children. So we have to formulate plans. Our child protection process is a child-centred process in Scotland. We're undertaking work jointly between Police Scotland and ourselves around making that process even better and making sure that it's trauma-informed by um, the developments around GII as a consequence of the recommendations of Lady Dorian. So I am very hopeful that actually the, the situation and how we support children in Scotland will be a much better positive outcome and we're, in the future we'll have less stories from children that have experienced these processes because that's what they are, they're processes. I suppose that actually we have, we have a children's hearing system that actually allows us to provide the level of safeguards around the welfare of children, where children require compulsion. Um, we, ha we do regularly refer these children into the children's hearing system and manage it through this, th that, that process. That process, uh, uh, children's hearing in itself are on a journey. And actually the journey is to kind of make sure it's this child-centered tribunal it's not, whilst it has, it's a legal tribunal, it's not a legal court system. So I think that we do quite a good job. There is some children that actually that are young people that are really challenging, but it's not just about a bill that will resolve that. We need to look at the resource issues and the supports for these children in parallel to any bill because irrespective of having a process to manage um, the risks that that child may have to themselves, to other children, or even to the community, if we don't have the right supports that are trauma-informed, 
um, we will still be managing the impact of what happened to that child well in its adult life. Leslie Bow. I absolutely agree with Kate and the work that is ongoing between Social Work Scotland and Police Scotland. And, and, and even if um, a child has been, for example, the victim of serious sexual crime, where in actual fact it wouldn't fit within the child protection procedures, i.e., you know, the child is not a significant risk of harm. So they have got family and carers around them and they've got support. We still, uh, on the vast number of occasions, still deal with it in a child protection manner, even though the child might not be in need of protection, if that makes sense. So um, they will stuff, you know, for, for, for children who have the family support around them and um, and their needs may not be as critical as others, we will still have that conversation with social work right at the very beginning to say, you know, it would be good to have a joint approach to this. Um, so whether the child fits within the child protection environment or whether it is a child victim, but actual fact there's still maybe some wellbeing needs that are required, but not protection. We will still go, we will still try and go um, and approach it in that manner. So I think from a, a protection and a general victim wellbeing perspective, um, we work very well together. Thank you. Fulton. Yeah, yeah. Convenient with regard to you, I've only got <clears throat> one brief question and then one area that can be kind of brief. I just wanted to um, finalise the last line of questioning by asking James uh, his view on the, the, the age the age question. If, it, if 12 is enough or it should be higher. I think as Leslie said, you know, it's a... It's a question that's difficult for us in the context of, you know, we police by consent, we police with the consent of communities, and we have to be mindful of the fact that it's us offering an, an input in relation to what that number should be, and it is a number, is not particularly helpful. What would be helpful is for us to be able to articulate and explain how we respond. So how do we respond when a young person, and a very young child in the context of under 12, offends? And if we're going to change the language as the bill requires and say causes harm, so we get away from that whole notion of a criminal justice system. A lot of what we've already done in Scotland over the last 10 years has been to move in that direction. I know you've heard about the whole system approach, which we have been one of the primary agencies involved in its development, because we readily see, and our officers readily see, that responding to the needs of a child is very much more in keeping with the description Kate provided, which is about a child's needs. I often describe this as it's the easiest thing for us to do, it's our training, it's our background to say A plus B, so C do D. Because what we're in the business of is collating evidence and we submit that evidence to the Crown Office for consideration of prosecution. That's our job, that's our job with adults. Why did C do it? Is it really a feature within that? That's for others to decide, not with children. With children we're much more focused now on why, what sits behind it, what's in their lives, what's their wellbeing needs. And the whole system approach has very much directed us towards that approach. An early and effective intervention you've probably heard of as well. That's merely about moving away from the world when Leslie and I started in the police. Every single child offence got reported to the children's reporter. What we should be looking at is protection, guidance, treatment or control. And if we don't have that test, there's no need to refer. So we refer through partners. We, we engage the support of those who are there to respond to the needs of the child within the community. It's much more effective, much more simple system of approach and much more child-centred. And what we are constantly evolving and changing and retraining our officers around is to move away from that simple evidential assessment, which is important, but it's part of the story with a child. The more important story is about their needs. What's their resilience? What's their support? What are the, what are the lack, what's lacking within that support? and not about a punitive approach. It's not a punitive approach, it's a needs-based approach because it's about behaviour change. What we want to see is children's behaviour change for their benefit, the family's benefit and community's benefit. So the age is something that I think others are better placed to comment on. Our job is to respond to the needs that that demonstrates and we respond much differently now than we did 10, 15, 20 years ago. And this is part of that process. That's why we see and readily understand why 12 gives you a demonstration of that change of approach, an approach we can adopt and deliver. It's very in keeping with where we are at the moment. How that evolves and changes in the future, I think, is for others to decide. Okay. Yes, I think, well, are you 
I well, think Mary was going to follow on from, from that. Yeah, Are you moving on to a new area? Well, it was sort of to round off my line of questioning. OK, and go for it. Then that you round off your questioning. Yeah. Um, so it was just to um, to pick up on that point that James made, and that I know Kate had made it earlier as well, just in terms of the... Because what we all want to know is what the impact of this bill will be. And we heard uh, last week that perhaps the, uh, the moving it to 12 <clears throat> doesn't actually incorporate a lot of children who are committing offences just now. But And I probably should have declared a, an interest at the start, convener, and I apologise for that, that I'm a registered social worker with the Triple SC. So I've, I've personally sat, as I know Kate both had, in children's panels uh, before with children who are on offence grounds. So can I just ask the panel briefly what they think the impact will be for children um, who go to children's hearings or, or uh, get offences or are on offence grounds up to the age of 12 and do they think it will have any impact on um, the older age group beyond 12, even if the, the law is, is not increased further? The age is not increased further, sorry. Um, Liz, are you happy for me? I suppose um, I think the impact for children over the age of 12 probably much the same as it is now. Okay, I don't foresee any significant change as such, although there is a whole load of orders here that actually my starting point as a, an experienced social work professional is where you have formal orders and the child is aware of a formal order and whilst that the act in itself doesn't suggest that you serve the order, the Act does suggest that you give the child a copy of the order. And that brings a whole different starting point to children. So we need to be clear about the impact of legal orders on children and how they are perceived. But we are more worried about the children under the age of 12 and some of the construction of the Act, or the Bill, it's not an Act yet, of the Bill. Particularly the introduction of um, an order, a child interview order. Um, in essence, um, it's for the police to go and get that order in consultation with the local authority. But I do use the word in consultation. Normally, when we come to actually investigate, and I and and in inverted commas, our starting point as social workers would be to investigate the welfare or, and the harm caused to the children. Police have a responsibility to investigate a crime. This bill isn't clear about what is the starting point for children under the age of 12, as far as I'm concerned. Um, actually, it almost reads like a quasi-judicial system for under 12s, though we have got the intent to actually make sure that we support children in the right way. And it's, that's kind of admirable, that we want to make sure that these children get the resources. But involving other people in that whole interview process, sheriffs, normally when we plan an interview, we do it through um, IRDs, initial referral discussions, and we would move to JII with an interview plan that would be agreed between police, social work, and probably sometimes health and education, dependent on who knows that child best. Whereas the sheriff is going to have sight of that interview plan, we're going to have to advise the child of that interview plan. We're going to have to give them a copy of an order. I do worry if we're going to actually shut down children by just actually, and we're not going to get to the nub of what has happened to them. And that would be my starting point as a social worker. We will still have to establish, and police will still have a responsibility to establish, is that child the actual suspect, perpetrator of this alleged offence? So they will have to establish that. Um, and how do we blend that to make sure that it doesn't impact the other issue that we kind of are worried about is the introduction of advocacy and supporters within that process. We're trying to move, sorry. 
I think we're going to come on to that in a bit. Right, okay. um, it's OK I'll if I move it. things along. Okay. It's, it's a, such an important subject, and I know we've got lots to get through, so I'm, I'm going to try and um, move colleagues on a bit. Mary, you were going to come in on. Yes. Thank you, um, convener. And my initial question follows on from the line of questioning that um, Fulton McGregor had opened up in relation to the age. Moving the age to 12 would put us in a, a cluster of four countries within the EU that have an age of, of, of 12, and we would still sit at the floor of what the... Um, UNCRC would recommend. Are the panels supportive then of a clause being um, added into the bill so that after a particular period of time the age would be reviewed with, with a view to incrementally increasing the age? And if you did support a clause going in the bill to incrementally increase the age, what age do you think it should stop at? Okay. Juliet, do you want to come in on that? Um, that's a really interesting question, um, and I think if it was possible to put in a clause that would ensure that the bill was incrementally increased, then that would um, definitely be a positive development, um, because I think that's very much in line um, with what Police Scotland and Social Work Scotland have been saying about this is a starting point, and we need to be looking beyond as to where next. I think we need to make sure that there are safeguards in place to ensure that it is increased um, and that it's not to review the age of criminal responsibility, it is to increase the age of criminal responsibility. And I think it would be important as well that there are processes in place to really monitor and evaluate what the impact has been on increasing it to 12 um, throughout the first three years or so of the enactment of this bill. Um, and make sure that there are um, the safeguards in place to ensure that the bill does achieve its policy intentions. Um, because as it stands at the moment, um, I do think the bill can be strengthened in terms of children and young people's rights. I do think that there are some amendments that are needed, particularly to get the voice of the child into the bill at all stages, particularly around police powers. Um, there are a number of areas where there's a duty where there needs to be a duty rather to explain to the child what's going on in, in accordance with the child's age and maturity. There are safeguards needed to make sure that this bill works for children with disabilities and additional support needs so that they know what's going on. Um, so I think if you have all those safeguards in place, then that would really support um, a duty to incrementally increase to increase the age of criminal responsibility at a later date and take an evidence-based approach to doing that to ensure that we have communities on side and it's something that there's public support for. Do you think should be the, the, the ceiling? Um, I don't think there should be a ceiling. I think it's something that we need to keep on looking at and um, increasing as, as the evidence presents itself to us. I, mean, I know the um, ENOC, the European Network of Ombudsmen of Children, I might not have quite got that right, the <laughs> Children's Commissioners of Europe are recommending 18 mm. um, and they do have quite a strong evidence base behind that call for 18 and so I'd say we should look to that but use the evidence to increase it as, a, as is seen necessary. Okay. Um, James? A slightly different focus, outcomes. Let's review the legislation with a view to seeing if it's improving the outcomes for children. First and foremost, if we're going to be genuinely child-centred, we need to see if it's made a difference and it gives you an opportunity at least to review the children who pass through a different system. They don't carry the label of criminality. That's the biggest significant change this will deliver, is to stop that label being applied to very young children. So what impact does that have? Does it have a positive impact? I know you heard some evidence about the experience with Denmark changing their age down and then back up. So what's the experience of Scotland? What's Scotland's experience? What's community's experience of it? Do we have the tolerant society that recognises the needs of children? Do we support those children? That's the measure for me about whether or not what all of us do, and, you know, this is our world, this is what we focus on. That's my purpose in Police Scotland is to further the rights of children and ensure that we support and protect them correctly. And that can sometimes be about responding to the harm they cause, but doing that effectively. Do we make it better? <coughs> That's the measure of success for this legislation. And to go down um, the, the route that you're suggesting, would, would that review would you include um, the support services that supported the children that are involved, the, the children that have been um, accused or responsible for committing some level of wrongdoing and the victims? One of the things we've learnt a lot, and I know you heard about it from the care experienced young people of Scotland, we've learnt a lot from listening to the voices of children and you know it's critical, it's been at the heart of a lot of what we've done in recent years. 
and Juliet explained that really eloquently, that it's the voice of that child will influence you more than anything. What was their experience? Their experiences will all be different. The more you put a process around a system, the less you listen to the voice of that child, the more you will apply something that is, feels structured and feels like something we force them through. And it will feel like that to us, as well as the people who are charged with protecting them. So, yeah, I would involve all of those communities as a whole, absolutely children who are subject to it, children more widely within society. Do they, are they aware of it? Do they see the change? Do they feel that change in society, a change in attitude towards them? There are almost, I think it's about one million under 18s in Scotland. Do we hear their voice? That's my job, is to make sure that we hear their voice inside Police Scotland. We're absolutely passionate about making sure that we do. They deserve a service from us, the same as every other sector of society does. Okay, or Leslie, do you have a, a view? Uh, no, I mean, I just, I just agree with uh, what Jim said. I, I do take the point that um, Kate uh, mentioned earlier in terms of the bill as it stands just now, I think presents some challenges, challenges for um, us to operationalise it. It seems like the bill is being constructed around um, children who have no or won't have any criminal responsibility, but the bill is an even greater criminal justice process than actually we see for children and adults at present time. And the part about where, where does this start, this has always been my um, issue with the bill, is that the bill starts from, I think, the point where we know it's that child. Actually, at the very initial stages of when something is reported, especially when it's something really serious, and we are talking about serious sexual crime or serious violent crime. There's no black and white. It's all shades of grey and diff varying shades of grey. It's that building block stage. And, and the bit for, for me is how do we easily, without further traumatising, causing further anxiety to a child who's going to be anxious, um, how do we find out actually if it is that child? Because at times um, it isn't they may have been falsely implicated in a, in, a, in a serious crime. And we want to establish that we have, we are dealing with the right child initially, so that that, right, that child gets the right help, right support, and has the best outcomes. And I think um, in terms of parts that Kate were mentioning around quite a very bureaucratic criminal justice system, that's not how we get to the truth of the matter quickly. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bring in Gail now because your line of questioning was around the yeah, investigative um, interviews. It, thanks, convener. Good morning, panel. My questions actually lead quite nicely on from um, what you were just saying, Leslie. It's about the powers to be able to take forensic evidence from children under 12, and um, the advisory group that that um, w was set up acknowledge that there still could be some circumstances where you're going to have to, to do that. So um, I just wondered, are you content that the powers to take samples from children strike an appropriate balance between the need to fully investigate um, incidents of a serious nature and then also the overriding ethos of what we're trying to do here, of not labelling children as criminals? And on the back of that, what you just said there just now, I think, was really important about... Um, steps to, to not further traumatise children and to try and reassure them that, you know, they're not going to be labelled as, as, as criminals as well. How do we strike that balance? On the vast, vast majority of children who may present with harmful behaviour, there will be no requirement whatsoever to take any forensic samples or biometric samples. That, that's the position now um, in terms of all children um, so, unless there is a real necessity to take biometric or forensic samples, we wouldn't take it. But in that situation where you did have to? Yes. In the, the small number of occasions where it would be necessary, relevant to do so, um, I think it's absolutely appropriate that we apply for uh, approval to obtain the necessary forensic samples unless there is a real um, 
critical need to do so quickly that could then be backed up by authorisation. I think the part that is, is difficult is what seems to be quite a complex process of getting it. I'm not quite clear in terms of the sheriff having to be in chambers or, you know, within the court setting. So in actual fact, sometimes things don't happen Monday to Friday, eight to four. Um, the bit about uh, the, the war uh, or the, the order, you know, there could be an appeal against it. So in actual fact, if we're talking about serious crime and we want to be able to investigate it timelessly as we would at the moment in time, do we have to wait until there is then an appeal process and that's concluded? Because if it is, then if it's very um, sensitive forensic samples that were taken, we have lost that. So, so there is a bit about the process involved is rather complex, can be elongated. However, when we're talking about serious violence or serious sexual crime, there will be a senior investigating officer to a point, which would be a detective inspector, no less. It would be a detective inspector who would be allocated that for investigation. They have to absolutely policy up why they're doing things and for what reason and the rationale for doing it. And I would have to say on another, you know, from my experience, if there was a requirement for forensic medical examination to take place of a very young child, in actual fact, there, it would absolutely have to be necessary. And there is still a bit about consent. And I have got I'm absolutely clear that no forensic medical examiner would forensically examine a very young child or in actual fact anybody, you know, when there was when it was going to be so traumatic for that person. They just wouldn't do it. Um, and can you just um, explain what the current policy is on the retention of the data that you um, collect from children forensically? Uh, Jim, do you want to cover that one? There's forensic data recovered from lots of people at the point of investigation, at the point at which the investigation is concluded, uh, for, for example, in the context of younger children, so under 12s can't be prosecuted when we are notified by the children's reporter of what, what action they're taking, then samples are destroyed. We can retain samples. The Criminal Justice and Licensing Act allows us to retain samples for accepted established cases, but they're subject to periodic review. So after three years, there is a review to see whether or not it's necessary and proportionate to continue to retain it. And then it's rolling two yearly reviews thereafter about the retention of those samples. What's happened in the recent past is obviously there's been the independent advisory group on biometric data, which has made further recommendations, which we are encompassing in some of the work we're doing at the moment around the age of criminal responsibility. So drawing some of that work together around under 18s and the recommendations that were made there. So it's our team that are starting to look at that now to consider how do we best give effect to that. And part of the challenge with that touches on what Juliet said earlier, how do you communicate this to children? It's a really, really important part for us is making sure the child understands what we've done, why we've done it, what happens next and what their rights are. That sounds easy in the context of this forum. It's not. It's very difficult to do. The children have different levels of learning. As Leslie said, you've got the challenge as well of when do you impart that type of information to a child? When are they ready to listen and when do they understand? And they might say to you, yeah, yeah, understand, but not understand. Who's the right person to communicate that information to them? And that's where more and more, and Kate's touched on it already, we work collaboratively because it's the best way to work. What we recognise is we are the police. So it comes with a label and it comes with a certain expectation, particularly for children. So sometimes it's about recognising when we are the right people to be involved, sometimes when we're not, and recognising the skills and the ability of others within a child's life. And it's about being very much centred on who is the right person for that child. That might be a social worker, it might be a teacher, it might be mum or dad, it might be someone different. Do we identify who's best placed to communicate information to children? So we are in a process of change around biometric data. Uh, and the review has identified the need for that to take place. There's consultation going on at the moment around that work, uh, and we are keen to be directly involved in it. We recognise the need for it, and we welcome the opportunity to ensure that the process we put in place is fair, <coughs> first and foremost, fairness. Alec Cole-Hamilton, um, 
Thank you very much, Convener. Good morning to the panel. I'd just like to start by reminding uh, members of my register of interest that I was formerly Convener of Together, the Scottish Alliance for Children's Rights. Given that the Government has uh, stated an intent to at least uh, incorporate the principles, if not the articles, of the UNCRC, um, can the panel tell us whether they think this bill is fully compatible with the UNCRC, and specifically directed at Juliet, but other people might want to come in. The provisions around place of safety suggest that at, in an emergency, that could be a police station. Can we just check whether that's compatible with Article 37, which is, of course, the, the principle about not holding child suspects in the same place that adults are held? Um, yes, certainly we welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to um, incorporate the principles of the UNCRC um, and we're really pleased to hear that they don't mean the general principles, that they do mean the intent of all the articles of the UNCRC. And this bill is a key way of taking forward one of the um, concluding observations of the UN Committee around raising the age of criminal responsibility, although as I've said before it may not go far enough. Um, there are definitely ways that this bill can be improved in terms of um, ensuring compatibility with the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And I'd say actually quite a lot of them are around introducing additional duties to seek the views of the child um, and also to um, make sure that we're communicating with the child in a way that the child understands and feels informed and feels empowered. And really reflecting back on what was just said about forensic sampling, then I think it's really important that there is actually a duty that's included there um, around informing the child about what's going on and communicating with the child about why the sample is necessary. Um, in terms of the place of safety, then we do um, recognise the need to be able to take a child to a place of safety. And certainly that would be compatible in terms of Article 37. And what we are concerned about is that um, there's a presumption that it shouldn't be a police station, but we'd actually like to see that to be a measure of last resort in terms of a police station. Um, and certainly if a child is taken back to a police station, then it needs to not be in a cell. It needs to be clear that it's in an, a child-friendly environment. And it's also really important that we listen to the views of the child, because when we're taking a child to a place of safety, then we need to talk to the child about what that place of safety might be. Um, so I know that they've looked at the Children's Hearing Act um, to see what the place of safety could be, and it may include, say, a community home, it might include um, a residential establishment, but it might also include a friend's house, a parent's house, and it's really important that there is um, that emphasis on ensuring that that place of safety is something that's emerged from the conversation with the child, where the child says they feel safe, they feel secure, they feel that they're in an environment where they can actually talk about what's happened to them. So that, that would be a key way of ensuring that it's more compatible with Article 37. Can, well, perhaps my next question will allow the other panellists to come in on that. Um, I, I think, Juliet, you made very clear the, the reference to the Children's Hearings Act. And, and indeed, in that act, um, other places of safety are defined. My concern, I think, is that the only place of safety defined on the face of this bill is the police station. And although it suggests, it intimates that that's only in an emergency, oftentimes, you know, in the midst of time, that might just become the default. And that's my anxiety. Certainly, um, a police station on a Friday, Saturday night is not the safest place in the world. Um, perhaps I'd like to bring in our colleagues from law enforcement here and uh, what your view is to um, how often you think that would be the place of last resort, where your guys on the beat who are intervening in a disturbance might think to take people as a matter of practice right now? Well, well yeah, I think we'll probably share it. I, I, think, I think you're absolutely right. Um, a police station is not the best place for a child, and especially not in circumstances when there is trauma and there's anxiety. I think the difficulty is and, and we have reached out to our 13 local policing divisions. The issue is, where else is there across Scotland? Where else is there locally to take the child? And, um, you know, I think there, there is a bit where there, there may always be a time where there, you know, it's the absolute necessity that you have to take a child to a, place of safe, uh, to a police station because of the situation and what is happening. You can't... You know, there will be circumstances that that will happen. I would absolutely agree with you that that has to be the last resort. However, until, that is the, or until we get to that case, there has to be resources, there has to be suitable premises for a child to be taken to that 
allows that child to be safe, to feel safe, and if necessary, and if it is part of you know, that initial investigation side of it, that um, if required, the, any process, and I hate using that process, but anything that um, is required at that point of time can be done discreetly, sensitively, and in a, in a, in a, a premises that is child-friendly and child-centred. I know that there has been talk about um, Barnhouse. I think people had referred to that. Um, I, think, I think there is a bit about actually we definitely wouldn't want or I definitely don't think it would be appropriate to take children who may be um, displaying the most serious harmful behaviour to be taken to the same accommodation with children who are at risk of um, harm themselves. But I think the, the the Barnhouse principles in terms of where a place of safety should be and what it should look like is absolutely right. <coughs> Jim? Yeah, absolutely. You know, our experience is that, just as you described, you know, at the point of crisis, which is when we respond, and as Leslie says, it's very often not between eight and four. It's out with those hours. It's at times where you have to have access to facilities that are suitable. I know Lindsay mentioned the, the work she's been doing in Western Bartonshire about having that 24-7 access. That's the type of thing we would like to see as suitable resources. It touches on Kate's point from earlier. There do have to be the right resources available across the country. We do accept that it's not always possible to achieve that. Sometimes it's not the right environment because the child may be so anxious, so on occasions violent, that it's difficult to be able to control and make sure that we can keep them safe. That's rare. The vast majority of occasions, you're going to be looking for something that's much more suitable to meet that child's needs. We want something that meets their needs, fundamentally. I've got one final question on this, and, and I think your, your answers there kind of um, draw out to me the, the desire to, to ask government when they, the ministers come to, to speak to us about the financial memorandum in respect to place of safety and the fact that there are models like the Barnhouse which will require additional investment to see uh, capacity brought in. But I just wonder if you could, um, again, to, to our friends from the police, um, if you can give us an idea of exactly what happens right now when a police officer decides that the place of safety they need to take them to is a police station, because we were very concerned that um, Lindsay Hambridge, who gave us the evidence last time, you know, she was taken to a place of safety, but that was a cell. Um, how do you use the? How do your officers use the, the the estate around the police station? Are they held in an office, or, or how does that work typically um, when they're taken to that as a place, last resort place of safety? We'll try and find somewhere that's suitable for the child. Uh, it's different across the country. The estate's very different across the country. I don't think it, it would be wrong to miss the change that's coming through the Criminal Justice Act. The Criminal Justice Act made a significant change in relation to the manner in which we assess, and we've given really robust guidance to our officers about the necessary and proportionate test. It's massively reinforced by the Criminal Justice Act. Is it absolutely necessary to bring this child into custody? We ask that question first and foremost, is it necessary? Why is it necessary? Is it in the interest because we think that the, the risks that child poses wider society? What's the best alternative available for that child? We're working with social work colleagues at the moment to look at the guidance that we provide our officers around that to try and improve at the custody setting, the manner in which it might be the right thing at the point of crisis. How quickly can we transition away from that? We are the first to acknowledge our cell complex is not the right setting for children. Sometimes it is absolutely necessary. Sometimes a child does pose a risk. And we're talking about children in the context of those under 18. And the law is different for different age groups. So 16 and 17 year olds are in a different space in terms of criminal procedure. Sorry. Clarify then, right now, police officers in Scotland will use the cell complex as a place of safety. It depends. It's different across the country. But it does you know, happen. Own, I can only yeah. draw on my own personal experience. Yeah. My own personal experience would be that we would look to have the child constantly supervised by another officer. We will try and find a setting that's suitable for them that's within the police office as least intrusive as possible, as least impactive as possible. 
I can't say with an absolute certainty that that would happen on every occasion. It is about resources and what's available at any given time, the dynamics of the circumstances they're working in at that time. But by and large, what we endeavour to do is to be as child-centred as we possibly can. The last thing we want to do is to traumatise any child any more than has already been done. Our officers will do everything possible to ensure that they are in a suitable setting to minimise the impact on them, minimise the impact of being in a police office, to be as friendly and as supportive as we can be. We never lose sight of the fact that they're children first, but our estate is what it is. It's not designed to meet that type of need. So it is about finding something. And I have heard recently about one example where they've tried to change some of the estate to make it more child focused. But as these are isolated examples. As I said, it's an evolution and a change over a long period of time. We've come a long way. The Criminal Justice Act has further informed that. This debate further informs it. But, yeah, you're right, you know, from a point of view, do we want children in a police setting any longer than necessary? Absolutely not. Thank you, um, Annie Wells, you're going to come in on search powers and capacity. Yeah, thanks. As the, the bill will obviously change some of the search powers as well that Police Scotland currently have, I've just got a couple of really quick questions, I'll, because I know we're probably running quite short on time. So it's like, how often are, are the police required to search um, children under young children and under which circumstances would searches be carried out and how are they currently informed of their rights? This was introduced um, about a year, six months ago, seven months ago. There was a six month review of the Code of Practice which was a significant change mm -hmm. in the manner in which your policy is delivered. I don't have figures to hand in relation to volume but I can certainly ask mm -hmm. and provide that in writing for the committee if that would be helpful. Um, the Code of Practice significantly influenced the manner in which we deliver. It's not on a consent-based process any longer. It's based on statutory powers. Mm -hmm. um, and we can provide further background and detail on that, if that would be helpful. Um, that's very much been a sea change in relation to the manner in which stop and search is used. But nonetheless, it is a legitimate policing tactic and is used in the context of keeping people and communities safe. And it is very much with a focus on safety for children. Excellent. And the only last one is, are you content that the powers of search afforded to the police in the bill are sufficiently clear and proportionate? Yes. I mean, from a policing perspective, it is very much it's about the whole picture. The legislation is only one small part of that. It's the code of practice, it's the training for our officers, it's the guidance we provide them is absolutely essential. You know, the evolution of policing as we move more towards are responded the needs of society than the criminality within society is well documented. That requires an evolution in the manner in which we police. That evolution is ongoing. Stop and search was a significant part of that. Uh, we got significant support from external partners. And that's been one of the really significant learnings for us is about knowing where to turn to for the right advice as that world and that society around us, particularly in the context of children changes. Where do we learn from? And we are absolutely willing to constantly learn, evolve our practice to be much more in keeping with the needs of particularly children. The Code of Practice is one example of that. It will have a 12-month review as well. There are checks being built into that process, quite rightly so, because we welcome and recognise the need for that scrutiny. It's absolutely got to be there, and we've got to be open to that and willing to learn constantly. Thank you. Yep. OK, thank right. you. Um, Kate Rocks um, helpfully outlined um, some of the current principles around um, child protection and the um, joint investigative interviews. It's obviously going to be really important that children that are subject to interviews um, can give their best evidence. Um, are witnesses content um, that this is going to be possible given the, the provisions of the bill? <sighs> I suppose um, when Police Scotland and Social Work Scotland embarked on reviewing the recommendations of Lady Dorian, the starting point was children as victims or witnesses. The starting point of the bill, uh, kind of that I outlined, probably at too much great detail, is a different starting point. The starting point is almost to establish facts. Is to as opposed to from um, a police perspective and for us, because we would be jointly involved. The, the starting point for child protection 
is about what has happened to that child and where does the risk currently lie. Okay, a, a, a byproduct of that might be around that child who is a victim um, getting access to justice through um, the adult justice system, but that uh, it as, is as a victim. My our worry is that the starting point feels quite different for that child. And even though that the, the review of the GII training and how we, we intend to progress nationally. Well, the starting point will be trauma-informed, and that is our aspiration, and it will feel much differently to children. The Act doesn't give us the level of flexibility that the current child protection processes have by means of the, the formal orders that will be put in place for these children. My worry is that a child will have access to other adults in a system. But actually, that we've spent a lot of time debating around child protection to reduce the number of adults that may well be part of that formal interview. And our aspiration is to have one adult with that child. Whereas if you look at the construct of the bill, you could have up to four adults in a room. And in the main, none of these adults, apart from one, who is the supporter of the child, and we have to define what that means because we don't know about the culpability of that supporter and the reason why the child has been there. But three of them won't be known to that child. So it isn't the best conditions for children to give any kind of information or evidence, though we're not supposed to be gathering evidence. We're supposed to be trying to find out what's happened to that child. So that is really our position. Oh, Juliet, do you have anything you want to add? Um, we think that it could be strengthened um, in terms of a rights-based approach. At the moment, there is a duty to inform the child that questioning has been authorised and that the child has the right not to answer the questions. Um, but this actually does fall short of a provision um, for um, requiring the police officer to, to explain to the child what's happening in line with the child's capacity and maturity. And we think that's the number one priority is the child must know what's happening, why it's happening, and we must make sure that the child doesn't feel like um, he or she's being interf uh, interviewed as a, as a suspect in the, in the questioning. Um, the other area where it could be um, strengthened is around the child-friendly environment. Um, I know it mentions this in the policy memorandum, but we'd actually like to see that on the face of the bill. So that way, then, the interviewing actually takes place in an area where the child feels safe, the child feels informed, knows what's going on, and empowered to take an active role in the proceedings that are going on. Okay, thank you. Do you have any comments you wish to make? For no, I, I, I totally agree with uh, what Kate has mentioned. I think, I think that our frustration to a, bit, uh, a bit is the fact that we, specifically around the interviewing, we have framed the model on how we interview a child on the very model that we want to avoid, which is a really criminal justice type model. So the part from that we um, apply for an order, an order specifically for serious harmful behavior, an order has to be granted. There can be appeals against the order. We have to um, explain to the child about the order, um, explain about the child's plan, provide a child's plan. Um, and in addition to that, have a number of people present, um, explain that there is basically a right to silence, which is in a criminal justice process and a process that that child will never be in. So it seems to have been constructed to an even greater extent than adults will have going through that process. And I think Jim's been really clear in all the discussions that he's had during this. It's a bit about actually, we should be doing this with the consent. If we have a consent-based model where parents and children or carers are involved in it, why do we need to have these very difficult, protracted processes that in actual fact, and I think Kate and, and our experience is, A, we will never get to establish if it is that child, which is really important, and B, 
will we get to the if we can't establish that will we get to the point of establishing actually why and what support and what measures and protection and have to be taken to to support that child in the future i think what nobody wants is actually the wrong child getting intensive support and there is another child or somebody who can actually be held responsible <coughs> evading that because in actual fact by the time that we get to the point of interview everything is clammed down so i think that that's and, and i suppose that goes for quite a bit of the bill it seems that we have put a very criminal justice process around a child and we're trying to take them out of the criminal justice system okay well I'd like to, unfortunately, we've, we've run out of time. If there's anything that you didn't get the opportunity um, to say, please do um, feel free to write to the committee. Um, thank you all for your, for your evidence this morning. It'll be very helpful in our, our deliberations and we'll suspend briefly while we change panels.
Okay, um, welcome back, everybody. Um, we now move on to our second panel of witnesses today. I'd like to welcome Andrew Alexander, Head of Policy at the Law Society of Scotland, Shabeen Began, Director of the Scottish Independent Advocacy Alliance, and Nicola Fraser, Operations Manager at Victim Support Scotland. You're all very welcome. Um, I suppose we'll kick off um, just by asking if you're supportive of raising the age of criminal responsibility. Yes, as a, an organisation as the largest charity supporting victims, we do support the increase in age of criminal responsibility. Um, we are quite aware at the moment raising it to 12, de facto it's not going to make a massive difference given the numbers involved. Um, what we are interested in is the implications on the victims aspect and levels of communication and information provided for them. Shireen. Um we, we um, have some questions, really, about the, the raising of, of the age of criminal responsibility only to 12. We think that, uh, well, actually, we support the evidence given by Together earlier on in terms of questioning why only 12. Um, we would like to see it much higher, actually. OK, thank you. Andrew. Um, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, we are at the Law Society are supportive of the increasing of the age of minimum criminal responsibility to uh, 12. Uh, we noted uh, that the UN committee uh, had uh, suggested that this should be a minimum um, and uh, that potentially kind of uh, standards could be raised at a later stage. Um, but we think that uh, 12 is an appropriate age and also coincides with other legally significant um, uh, steps at the age of 12, uh, such as the ability to raise a court action, to make a financial claim, uh, or to instruct a solicitor for those purposes. OK, thank you. Um, I'll bring in colleagues now. Nobody's looking at me. Oh, Alec Cole Hamilton, you can go first. I'd like to, because particularly because we've got Shabin here, I'd like to um, address the advocacy provisions within the bill. Um, Shabin and I worked together on the amendment for 122 in the Children's Hearings Act. It's nice to work with you again on this, Shabin. Um, just first and foremost, I'd like to ask about capacity, because one of the problems with actually making 122 reality in the children's hearings, it took a while to just kind of get all that on stream. Are you confident that we have capacity in the in independent advocacy network to meet the needs of of this this provision well we're still discussing 122 and uh, so reality is that children who are going through the children's hearing process at the moment don't universally have access to independent advocacy um, I know that the Scottish Government is working on developing a model uh, for the the kind of rolling it out right across the country. At the moment, the way that things stand, capacity is a huge issue for advocacy organisations, uh, especially in the context of children and young people. And my organisation produces research on, um, in terms of the advocacy map every two years, and children and young people who have a legal right to access independent advocacy under different bits of legislation, uh, primarily the Mental Health Act, are still desperately in need of independent advocacy um, and the provision isn't there. And the, the, the main reason for the lack of provision is the lack of funding from local authorities and NHS boards. So um, if the provision was, it, there would be provision, I think. Um, our members are keen to work with children and young people and try to work with children and young people as much as possible. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a universal problem of funding, really. So if it's a problem of funding, if we're not to set ourselves up to fail with this provision, should we amend the financial memorandum to ensure there are resources to bring independent advocates on stream? I would like to see um, quite a bit of amendment around the bill, particularly in regard to independent advocacy. I think that there needs to be clarity about what the bill means by an independent advocate. Um, when I first saw this, um, I wasn't clear about what, what it would be really useful to have a clear definition of independent advocacy in the bill. I would like to see something that, that resembles the definition of independent advocacy in the Mental Health Act. Um, I am confused and I imagine that other people are probably confused about the, the requirement for independent advocates to be legally qualified. I, if I was a young person going through this process, I would be really confused about the role of my solicitor or lawyer and the role of my independent advocate if they're both legally qualified. 
do you know, what, what are they doing? Uh, the, there are parallels in the mental health system uh, where people have a legal right to access an independent advocate and they also have a legal right to legal representation. And those two roles have worked collaboratively in, um, in terms of supporting the, the person who's going through the mental health system and have been able to, to work to the benefit of that person. So I think that there, there's parallels that we can draw from, but I would like to see clarification in this bill around what an independent advocate should be doing what their role is, the recognition that they might have um, a more qualitative role um, and relationship with the young person. Ideally, when I've worked as an independent advocate, I've had the opportunity to build up a relationship with people and seen them much more often than they might do other professionals, for example, uh, their, their lawyer, um, and been able to help them think through what their rights are and to also to make sure that they fully understand what their rights are. Somebody um, in the panel earlier on talked about how a young person might say that, oh yes, I understand, and give you all the indications that they understand because that's what's expected of them, but not really have a full understanding and appreciation of the situation that they're in or um, the consequences of that situation. If I may, I'd, just one final question on this section. It, it, it follows on very nicely from what you've just said. And, and so specifically for you, Shabin, but I'm sure the other panel members will have a view. We heard from the last panel concerns and anxieties from both social work and even the police that this section around uh, interview orders um, actually sort of goes against the principles of policing by consent in this country. There are no suggestion. For example, this is far more uh, regimented than anything around adult interviews, interviews of adults adult suspects and there's no no reference to a right to silence for example which is almost as important as a right to be heard um, do you think that this section goes too far and impinges on that principle of policing by consent and the rights of people who are being interviewed I think that there needs to be much more flexibility built in if we're going to have something specifically for children then we need to have um, flexibility and it needs to be child-centred. Uh, there needs to be a much stronger human rights-based approach within the legislation. Um, I'm not that familiar with the criminal justice system, but from what I could see from the bill, it, it seems to um, um, resemble quite strongly the criminal justice system. And, and I don't think that's the intention of, of this piece of legislation. We wouldn't be, we think that there needs to be further work done on this to, to make it more child-friendly um, and child-centred and taking into consideration traumatic experiences that children might have come from uh, and experienced and the fact that this should be about the well-being of, of that young person. Can I bring in the Law Society, particularly on the issue of whether this uh, it flies in the face of the principles of policing by consent and things like right to silence? Um, I think that when it comes to this type of interview process, um, it is important that the rights of the child are respected, um, that there are safeguards in place, um, but also that there is, you know, as Shabin has said, um, you know, sort of a collaborative approach with the various parties that are involved, and the, the mental health system is, I think, a, a very useful uh, parallel to think about. Um, we, um, you know, sort of believe that the, you know, sort of can be, you know, sort of effective roles for uh, lawyers um, and for, um, you know, sort of uh, others involved uh, in the process. Um, and uh, although we would want to avoid a situation where uh, proceedings felt particularly criminal, we think that um, that there are, you know, sort of important safeguards uh, to be in place, particularly around, you know, sort of reminding the child that they don't need to answer questions if they don't want to. Um, and um, uh, so it, uh, we think that uh, there is the opportunity for guidance, you know, sort of under Section 46, which might um, bring some more of these details forward, um, although equally kind of it may be that uh, some provisions could be brought onto the face of the bill. And does the victim support charity? The problem is that what we're talking about here is not victims. Um, my situation is, is entirely different. What I'm looking for is 
the victim's right in this whole process. I totally understand that we're looking for child-centred, and I to as an organisation, we totally understand that. We also understand that it's a consent system, but we have to ensure that for each offence, that victim also has rights towards communication, information and support. Um, so although I don't argue anything that's being said, I just need to reiterate that at the other side of the table, there's a victim who also requires that. Specifically on that, there is provision in the bill for um, information to be provided to the victim as to, to what's happened and the feedback as to how that's been dealt with. Um, are you, does that go far enough or would you like to see some restorative justice included in this? Or restorative justice is certainly a further step forward. Where we are currently in the system with using the children's hearing process, we still to this day don't have enough information for victims. Um, I think because things like SCRA are so limited in relation to Section 53 of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act that they can only give out a, a limited amount of information. Now, that impacts on victims because what I need to say to a lot of people is, yes, we have a child who is supposedly or being alleged to have committed an offence. An awful lot of these offences are also against children. And what we lose sight of is that that child, this one goes straight into a system, this one doesn't. And there isn't that level of support. Currently, the system is letting them down. Before we move to this, we have to ensure that the information and the understanding of how the system works is put out to communities. Thank you. I can I bring in Annie Wells? Thanks very much. <clears throat> um, Mine is probably around the first sort of a questions that Alex brought in regards to the age. And I think quite a lot of people say it's 12 kind of doesn't go far enough and why are we starting at 12? Um, Mary Fee raised a point at a previous committee meeting stating that in a room of 20 young people, each and every one of them develop differently. Um, and Dr McDermott highlighted that some, some academics have suggested there could be a criminal responsibility test. Is this something that Go, and it would go further than just understanding right and wrong. And is this something that we should be looking at and we should be reviewing? Um, and just also on the same sort of a line, staggered ages of criminal responsibility, different crimes relate to different ages within 12 to 18. Is this something that we should be looking into? If we're starting the bill at 12, if that's what the starting point is going to be. Sorry. I'd like to come in on that. Either, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, well, um, I, I, I think that we need to build in a system where things like disability and additional support needs and maturity, I, I totally agree that, that different children and different people mature at different stages. And, and I think that, that those are the, the, the nuances that the, the legislation isn't very good, any legislation isn't very good at picking up. Um, I, I don't know enough about um, having different levels of criminal responsibility for different ages, but I think that, that there needs to be further work done on the fact that 12 has been chosen. I think that looking at what other countries do and looking at 18 potentially um, would, be, would be much more useful for children and young people, but also for our society. Think about a, a criminal responsibility test of understanding. I don't know enough about yeah. it, but um, I think it's worth pursuing and finding out more about mm -hmm. it and seeing what value and impact that might bring to the mm -hmm. system. Cool. Andrew? Um, certainly, kind of as I'd mentioned, um, you know, sort of, uh, the UN committee had suggested that 12 should be a minimum level and that potentially there should be adjustments at a later stage. Um, uh, up from that, um, there is a, you know, sort of a degree of kind of consideration of capacity, for instance, when it comes to uh, children at uh, age 12 of um, uh, capacity when it comes to instructing a solicitor, which is around kind of whether they have a general understanding of what it means to do so in that instruction. Um, the concern might be that potentially if you were to have a series of different kind of categories 
um, uh, dependent on age or offence, then that might proliferate the different types of responses required by the police or by other agencies. Um, and it may be that kind of uh, bearing in mind that the recommendation of the um, you know, sort of UN committee was that uh, incremental steps might be taken at a later stage, that um, you know, sort of either kind of uh, as part of the kind of post-implementation uh, scrutiny of a bill like this, uh, or potentially even you know, sort of by amendment to include um, you know, uh, the likes of statutory instruments, you could um, uh, look to vary the age at, uh, at a later stage. Um, if not, kind of develop a, a, a more uh, nuanced uh, measure around capacity uh, on the face of the bill as it stands at the moment. Thank you. Okay. Mary Fee. Thank you, um, convener. Just to follow on the line of question around um, qualifications and advocacy, um, the government has said that it wants to ensure that advocates have um, suitable qualifications and, and training to do, to do the role, and it has stated that, in their view, an advocate should be legally trained, and it, it tends to um, consult. And I'd be interested in the panel's views, and perhaps I could start with um, Andrew on, on whether or not advocates should be legally trained. Be, because we heard at an earlier panel <clears throat> that the, the bill puts um, a criminal justice slant on the approach to young people, um, where what we need is a needs-based and a supportive approach to young people. So should it be a lawyer that provides advocate, advocacy? Um, Once we've suggested that, um, you know, Steve, uh, that it should not be, you know, sort of simply a, a legal qualification, but actually it was around kind of experience of dealing with um, children and young people, um, and and obviously kind of with solicitors, they're dealing with children and young people in a variety of different contexts, not simply uh, criminal justice, but also through the children's hearing system and the like, and um, it is um, that ability to to deal with, I think, children and young people in these situations that is. Uh, particularly important. Um, there may be in, you know, sort of if you have, uh, for instance, uh, a solicitor involved and also a legally qualified um, uh, advocate, then there may be some confusion or, you know, sort of perception issues around uh, what the roles of those are. There are successful examples in other contexts where, you know, sort of that has worked well. And also there is the opportunity for guidance to be able to flesh out the um, differences between these types of roles. Um, so I think that could be successful. Okay. Shabin? Um, we don't support the, the idea that um, these independent advocates should be legally qualified. As I said earlier on, I think it, it creates so much confusion. There's the potential for, for confusion between those two individuals, but also, more importantly, there's the confusion for the young person. And, and I would ask, go back and ask, what is the purpose of the independent advocate? Because if, it, if it's legal advice that we're looking for, then the lawyer is, is ably qualified to provide that. My understanding of, of this situation is that independent advocacy would bring something else to, to the situation and that it would be about reinforcing a person-centred, a child-centred approach to all of this and making sure that the, the, the child or young person was able to fully participate in this situation as much as possible. And advocacy facilitates all of that. So if you, if you think about the panel principles of, of a human rights-based approach, participation is the first um, aspect of it. And then accountability, advocacy helps people to ask questions and make sure that the, the child or young person understands why decisions have been made, why particular actions have been, have been taken. And non-discrimination, I think, is, is, is central to any kind of advocacy approach in terms of making sure that, not that everybody's treated in exactly the same way, which is a kind of old-fashioned way of looking at non-discrimination, but that actually people's needs are, are taken into consideration. So my point earlier on, about children um, with disabilities or additional support needs or whatever, that advocacy would be about addressing that imbalance of power and, and helping that young person to be able to participate and, and take part in the whole process um, appropriately. And then empowerment is the next um, aspect of the panel principles, 
advocacy is all about um, providing support and being on the side of the person, um, the young person, and, and empowering them to, to ask questions themselves and um, uh, advocate for themselves and to be able to, to take as much control of the situation as they possibly can. And then, of course, legal. So, um, so that everything is, is ha that is happening is legal and is within the, the appropriate legislation. Just just before I bring um, Nicola in, um, so I just want to be clear that you think the advocate should be someone that, that does more of the emotional support for, for the young person? Well, it's not just emotional support. There is, uh, to, to go back to your question about qualification, there is an advocacy qualification that's been developed by one of our members called the Advocacy Project in Glasgow um, that's being rolled out across Scotland. So we're not talking about people who don't have the experience and knowledge to support people appropriately. And also, it, an independent advocate, it's really important that the independent advocate has a clear understanding of the legislation and the, the context that they're operating in and the rights of the person. Um, I think that the advocates do provide emotional support, but they also provide a, a whole range of other support, which is about, uh, you know, cutting back on. Uh, so we, we, some of us might have experience of being involved in a situation where where people are using language that that is unfamiliar to us, where the situation is intimidating, where there's a massive power imbalance between us and the people who are doing things to us. Uh, for want of a better phrase, um, and, and advocacy addresses those sorts of things and those sorts of imbalances of power. So it, it, it is emotional uh, support, but so much more too. So it should be centred on what the child needs? Totally centred on what the child needs, yes. Okay. Nicola? Very difficult for me. I'm coming from a completely oh, yeah. different side. What I'm nervous about is I'm hearing all this support, and I totally agree with all that support, but what about your six or seven year old victim? What support are they getting when samples are taken, when, when they're being spoken to by police? I have an anxiety that, that we're building in a huge imbalance again. We're very much going down that criminal justice route, the needs of the child, but that's the person that's actually being blamed for this. Where is the needs and the rights of the child that's actually had this done to them? And I get it's, it's having to find that happy medium because if you want to expand the age of criminal responsibility further, you're going to need society to back you up. And unfortunately, if that support for victims isn't there, your society won't back you because they won't see an 18-year-old as somebody who doesn't have responsibility. I'm sorry if you're sitting with a child who's had something done to them, that's how you're going to feel. So I, I totally get the advocacy bit but I do feel that we need more support on the victim side. Can I just come in? I would say that we would support advocacy support for victims as well. We, do you know, I, I completely yeah. understand your point about the imbalance of power. Yeah. I think that you know, it, it's about looking at this in a wider context. It isn't about creating more imbalances. Yeah. Um, so we would support advocacy support for children who are victims, children and young people who are victims of, of crime as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I mean, obviously the implications of, of, of this legislation, it, it stretches quite far and wide. So we would need to ensure that in all the organisations that do all the supporting stuff for, for victims, that appropriate measures are put in place to ensure that they don't lose out. Yeah. Yes. But also to recognise that victims can be perpetrators Absolutely. as well. That, you know, it's, it's not always black and white. No. There's mm -hmm. a huge grey area. And I mean, we are very aware of that. We, we help a lot of people that have been victims themselves and then go on to commit. So I get that the, the child centre aspect of all of this and providing support to prevent further offending is vitally important as long as we don't lose sight of the impact on victims and communities. Hilton. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, I think that the last uh, conversation there um, raised a, a lot of good points and for me probably brought into focus what I think that this bill is all about. It's about um, <coughs> setting down a marker of where we are as a country and how we treat our children and young people and that if a child's criminal, where, where they're, when they're criminally responsible, um, we'll say more about what's happened in their, in their, their background uh, and upbringing. Um, but I think there's definitely a, a big conversation to have there. I wanted to, to look at a specific aspect. We've talked in all the various panels at, at points. I've talked about the children's hearing 
process, which is a very integral part of this uh, system. And I wanted to ask about advocacy and that specifically, and not just in the hearing system as a whole, because um, I know that there'll be social workers and teachers and others in there that, that should be doing that, but specifically around when a child sits in a hearing and is given a fence grounds. And we talked about in the first panel that, um, that last, two weeks ago, sorry, that um, when that happens, um, a lot of the times if a child, particularly if they're quite young, 12, 13, 14, maybe even younger than 12, um, they have got a, a tendency to say, let's get this over with, and so do the parents. How important is advocacy in those situations and how can that ad advocacy work to make sure that that child knows exactly the consequences of accepting offence grounds? In my experience, advocacy quite often slows down processes um, because advocates are there to make sure that the young person fully understands the situation. The independent advocate is independent of all the, the different parties and is, is there solely for the child and young person. And I know from um, talking to some of our members who work in the context of children's hearings that the child and young per or young person and the parents or carers Everybody wants the situation to be over as soon as possible and, and put it behind them and move on. Um, but the, the advocate is quite often the person who's there making sure that the child and young person fully understands what's going on. Part of the, the role of the independent advocate is to make sure that they talk through the consequences of any particular action. So quite often when, when advocates work with people, my, in my experience of having worked with adults who've been involved in the criminal justice system for a long, long time, um, they've, people haven't been able to, to develop decision-making skills and also to develop the skills to think through the consequences of any particular decision that they make. And so a, 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 a big skill that advocates bring to the situation is making sure that somebody fully understands, even when they're saying, oh yes, yes, I understand, and wanting to move on, that the advocate has to reassure themselves that that person does fully understand the, the, the whole situation and the consequences of that situation. So I think that advocacy wouldn't necessarily speed up the process, it would slow it down, and that would be a, a positive thing, I think. I agree. Um, and uh, I, I would agree with, uh, with that as well. Um, and obviously, you know, so there is often in these situations the involvement of uh, a solicitor. Um, uh, it is important, you know, so for proceedings to take place without delay, but um, the consequences, you know, sort of can be significant um, and uh, have seen, for instance, you know, sort of around disclosure, which the, the bill uh, deals with, that the consequences of having kind of particular items disclosed uh, at a later stage can uh, severely impact your kind of outcomes as a young person. And in terms of a practical example of that, you know, you could be looking at a 12-year-old facing offence grounds him and his parents and everybody else around want it to be dealt with quickly. And you can understand that. They don't want the stress of that environment anymore. And that 12-year-old isn't thinking about 10 years' time, a disclosure. And I think it's a really uh, tough nut to crack, to be honest with you. It really is, because you do have the right of the child and family at that point as well, wanting the process to be dealt with speedily against what you think might be the right in 10 years' time, and I think it's, a, it's, it's certainly one personally I've, I've always struggled with, and I'm so glad it's something that's come through in this particular um, debate for this bill, because I think it's a really difficult area, but advocacy is crucial for it. I, I think it's really crucial that you've got an independent advocate who's familiar with the situation, and, you know, uh, as an independent, former independent advocate, I would know the, the, the system and be able to, because quite often you're dealing with people who haven't had a previous experience of this sort of thing, and so don't really understand and won't be thinking about in 10 years' time that this is going to appear on somebody's disclosure, um, that an independent advocate says, well, do, do you know, if you do A, do you know that the potential consequences of this in 10, 15 years' time are X, Y, and Z? That that's quite a revelation for, for quite a lot of people. Again, it's the other side of the coin. Um, I understand that somebody wants the process to go quickly. 
I think if you look at it from the point of view of a victim, I don't disagree with that. Um, they definitely want it to be resolved quickly. The biggest issue that you've got is that actually, unless they opt in to a system of being given information by SCRA, they actually don't find out anything. The first time a victim might have contact from anybody will be when SCRA actually get the referral from the police and they send a letter to the victim to advise them that they've got this and do they want to opt in to get more information. It's also very, very highly aware of the fact that we're getting so many calls through our National Support Centre and our helpline, and we're dealing with a variety of very intense cases at the moment that they don't receive information. So if there are no further actions done on that child, that victim doesn't know that. They just get told there's no further action. They don't know if social work have been involved. They don't know anything of what is happening. We have a huge gap here. We have a huge gap. We're supporting and we're providing absolutely the support for all these people, but the victim's sitting with absolutely nothing. And we have to address this. We have to address it. Thank, thank you. I think uh, the, the points uh, you're making are, are, are well made, uh, Nicola Fraser. I think probably in particularly in relation to bringing um, our communities with us in taking this approach. Um, I know that um, Gail Ross wanted to ask some more questions about victims specifically. Yeah, thanks, convener. Hi, hi panel. Um, I, I, was, um, I was struck by a lot of things that you've been telling us, Nicola, and I think that um, Obviously, with the bill the way it is, there, there is a focus on the perpetrator rather than the victim. Um, just in general, can you explain how this... I, I know that you've gone into it briefly, but can you explain what support is currently available for victims, child victims of crime? Normally, what you would hope for is that when a crime is reported to the police, that a referral would be received, whether that be a child or an adult. That doesn't always happen. Um, so sometimes victims will not be referred on to support services. That is part of the Victim and Witnesses Act, that they should be, but we're working closely with Police Scotland in relation to that, because there's always complications to getting referrals. The anxiety we have is that you have a massive process surrounding children offending. So by the time the decisions are made, the police do the report, um, you go, it goes to Crown Office and SCRA, it's made a decision whether it goes to the actual child hearing. There's not an awful lot happening for that victim. Now, there should be a risk plan, etc., being put in place, but we find that sometimes the victim is way down the communication line. So say that does go to a children's hearing and the victim then gets the letter from SCRA. Now, what Victim Support Scotland have done is, along with Scottish Government and SCRA, is we now have a service level agreement. We've now designed leaflets that go with that initial letter from SCRA so that victims immediately on receiving that have access to support services. And that's why we're noting that we're getting an awful lot more through our National Support Centre and Helpline because the biggest issue is that lack of information. I've had a lot of meetings with SCRA um, and discussed around what they can disclose and what they can't disclose, and I understand that. It's for the benefit of the child. You don't want to put that child in a, a difficult situation. But we have to remember that the victim doesn't know what's happened. And I think off table, we are looking, we're working currently on some case studies for you that I think would be really beneficial to show you where the actual blockages are. And I mean, currently we're looking at three cases that we're supporting. These are um, sexual cases. Victims range between four and nine. They have received no information. And what I need to explain to you is these victims are the ones that have had to move school because the perpetrator is innocent till proven guilty, but goes to the same school. Yeah, so that's the, the child, the victim's the one that's having to move. They're going to have to move house, it's a small community. We need you to see the impact that that has on victims and the fact that they don't receive the same level of support. And on, although we're working very hard with SCRA and other organisations, there are still gaps in communication and information. Currently, as the bill stands, do you think that there is a balance between protecting the victims 
giving them the information, but also protecting the child perpetrators of whatever incident has happened. Balance, right. Um, and I, I, I feel that to make this work, as I say, raising it to the age of 12 is an easy sell because actually, de facto, it's not going to make any difference. But if you want to raise it, you know, in Scotland, which we absolutely do, then we need to bring society with us. And if you've got victims out there that receive absolutely no information or no support, that's going to be a difficult thing. Okay, and uh, j just to, to wrap up, are you content that the provision of information going to victims by the principal reporter will only occur in serious cases? If they want information, they have to opt in and then they will receive information. It's, it's difficult to explain how it works. If an individual goes to a children's hearing or the, the reporter decides not to continue to a hearing, then that's all they'll be told. There's no further action. If there's a few charges, but you only appear on one of those charges and they decide on joining together and putting out an order, if you're not on the actual charge that that order's on, you get told no further action. So you're not actually aware that there's anything being done. And there's probably huge support going on for that person. But unfortunately, the victim doesn't know that. And if you look at a victim's journey, they need closure. Are these appropriate provisions to be put in this bill? Or are these changes that need to be made elsewhere in the system? I understand the importance of not disclosing information about a child who has committed an offence. I totally understand that. I think, I mean, having been, you know, looking at what the advisory group recommendations, they've said that there has to be appropriate and effective support available to victims. So we need to work closely to make sure that these victims on the first point of contact with, say, the police or whatever, are getting that support. That's the important bit. And we also need to ensure that the information and the communication that we provide covers everything. We need, mm -hmm. people don't understand how the children's reporting system works. Mm -hmm. In society, it's bad enough with the criminal justice system, but people don't know how the children's reporting system works. And I think we need, if we're raising the age, we need to make that clearer. Okay, thanks. If he had a supplementary on that. Thank you, you know, it, it follows on from the, the line of questioning that, that, that Gail Ross has been asking you about, Nicola, because when you say that you're working on case studies that you could bring to us that would help to um, make completely clear where, where the, the, the gaps are. Um, and I note from the submission that victim support, you, you've said that with appropriate safeguards, it would, this would better protect the interests of victims. Now, while it's useful to see where the gaps are, will you also, or will you be able to show us where the bill could be improved so that we can plug those gaps? Or if you can make the links to other pieces of perhaps legislation where subsequent ch changes could be made, because that would be really helpful for the committee. Absolutely. We will, I mean, the, one of some of the cases that we're looking at, it involves a lot of gaps within the whole system and because we've worked from day one the only reason I don't want to bring it to that it's not correct for this forum it's very sensitive but I do think that the content and where the issues have risen we can show you that and it will interpret to the bill maybe where we need to tighten up communication and that's inter sort of um different organizations both third sector and public sector and how we tie that up that would be very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Are any other colleagues wishing to come in again? No? In which case, is there anything that we haven't asked you that you would have liked to have answered? Or is everyone content? Okay. Well, thank you very much for your evidence this morning. And I close the session. We're now moving into um, private session. So if I can ask the gallery to clear and close.